Hello and welcome to Quarterlight, your car brochure channel, and in today's episode, the Peugeot 304. Hello and welcome back to Quarterlight, and if you're new to Quarterlight, we're a car brochure channel here on YouTube, looking at car brochures from around the world for the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, and sometimes beyond that as well. So if you're interested in little fun facts and details of cars and car brochures, please consider subscribing. Anyway, back to today's episode, the Peugeot 304. And this brochure is looking at the estate version or wagon, depending on which country you come from. Anyway, let's throw this on the board and have a look to see what this has to offer. So here is today's brochure, like I said, the Peugeot 304. First introduced in 1969, and this particular brochure is from 1980, so certainly an old fashioned looking car for 1980, I think. In fact, this brochure is so late um, that the saloons would have actually stopped production by now. So the saloons went from 1969 till, till 1979, and then the estates appeared a little bit later, September 70 when the estates appeared and they ran till 1980. So this is kind of like the final throw of the dice for the three or four. Um, so a very late brochure indeed. And if we flip to the back of the brochure, we can have a look at the back and yeah, it looks pretty old fashioned from the back as well. So you can think of them in, buying one of them in 1980. Although I do like them, there's no doubt about it. This would have been the top of the range one, the SL with head restraints but still no wiper on the back unusually enough very unusual tail lights aren't them like triangular shaped tail lights um, and if we just move down the brochure all we get is a little date there saying 1980 doesn't even tell you the month or anything just tune that in there we go nice little badge there Peugeot finance and if we move it to one side little Peugeot catchphrase at the time world famous for strength and, and certainly at this time they were particularly strong cars anyway let's open the brochure up and have a look inside so right at the end of the production for the estate only two models the gl and the sl so we start with the gl because that would have been the base model at the time so let's just zoom in on this on that main image and this particular example looks like it's in either a very dark blue or maybe black uh, like I say unusual tail lights and little triangle tail lights aren't they nice thing about these is that very low sill for loading things into the back you notice with the GL it's kind of got like a carpeted looks carpeted or some time type of material on the floor and the back of the seat now I only mention that because when we see the SL and indeed a lot of the top of the range of states for Peugeot's around this time an interesting floor but we'll come to that in a moment so we're thinking a pretty practical car for the time but like I say 1980 is certainly a car showing its age the text telling us the GL the three or four estate designed to give superb comfort for five people as well as being a fully useful Lord carrier for relaxed safe driving inertia real front seat safety belts electric windscreen washer and wipers, childproof locks on rear doors and heated rear window. And with reclining front seats, an electric clock and padded sun visors with vanity mirror on the passenger side, the GL has an impressive list of standard equipment for the comfort and safety of driver and passenger. And when you need to carry large cumbersome loads, the 304 GL quickly transforms into a really practical car. Simply unclip a couple of catches and the rear seat falls down to give a useful load space of 52 cubic feet. So, not a split rear seat, but you know a solid folding seat. Certainly a practical small car. The boot is low because with front wheel drive there's no transmission tunnel running the length of the car and the wild ta wide tailgate lifts on springs compensated struts. It's easily operated using one hand, something you'll appreciate with a heavy bag in the other. 
all round independent suspension means that each wheel soaks up roughness in the road surface to eliminate vibrations transmitted to the passenger compartment. And no doubt, I've never been in one of these, but no doubt, French cars around this pe- time period were very comfortable cars. I mean, it wouldn't have been quite as floaty as a Citroën, but I'm sure a comfortable car nevertheless. It says, and the suspension system equipped with Peugeot's, Peugeot's double acting shock absorbers is rugged enough to cope with loads of up to £1,025. With its lively 1290cc engine, the GL has a top speed of 94 miles per hour and plenty of power. 65 bhp at 6000 rpm means that the GL is equally at home around town and out on the open road. Driving will be easy on your pockets as well. Under official government test, the 304 GL returns a figure of 42.8 miles per gallon at a steady 56. But if you don't have to carry large loads to benefit from the GL estate, it will make light work of your weekly shopping trips or provide comforts for the whole family on long journeys. A little bit of a closer zoom in on that GL model. No rev counter. Looks like we've got a clock in the place of a rev counter. A little bit of the Peugeot badge in silver on this GL model. So I kind of like a simple but effective um, sort of interior. And I would imagine in 1980s these were the kind of the last of the 304s and they were certainly showing their age at this time. I wouldn't be surprised if you got some kind of good financial deals to sell the last of them as car manufacturers used to do. So I'm sure there was a bit of a bargain. A bigger bit of a bargain and also something different to see because I don't know how many of these actually sold in the UK but I'm sure it was relatively low numbers. Have a look on the interior, looks like vinyl seats, I would imagine at this time. No head restraints. The UK was a little bit behind, or indeed Europe was a little bit behind when you certainly look compared it to the safety standards in Australia. You know, they were having head restraints for quite some time, and here we are not worrying about it. And what seems to be quite typical with um, 70s cars in all, very often did this sort of like bed type arrangement for whatever reason I'm not sure the reasoning behind it or how popular it was but you don't seem to get that feature in modern cars and then a little bit of a dimensions for it and a good you know picture to see sort of the whole overall shape of the car an unusual shaped car the estate I mean the 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 saloon particularly had a sort of a long overhang after that rear uh, wheel. This was a much shorter, stubbier back end on it. An interesting car, and like I say, I can't imagine too many of them were sold in estate form in the UK at least. And then we move up to the next model, the top of the range at the time, the SL. I don't know what the price difference was, but I think it was certainly worth going for the SL. The GL is certainly like the plain Jane model, but the SL. It's quite fancy actually, it's got some nice little touches in there that really lifts the car I think. Let's just have a look at the text first. So it tells us with the same 1290cc engine as the GL Estate, the SL also gives great performance and is enough power to cope with large loads. The SL though offers several refinements to the interior and even more comprehensive standard equipment. There's soft cloth upholstery, full, fully reclined front seats with head restraints, two-speed electric wipers, chalk warning light, and outside a gleaming metallic paint finish. With all the equipment of a luxury saloon, the SL Estate is just as practical as the GL. The load area floor is covered in tough laminate with a mahogany vinyl finish. Like I said, the the load area on the previous models was some kind of like material. And we'll certainly zoom in on that um, mahogany vinyl finish. It looks something a little bit special. And protected by rubber runners, which also prevent loads from shifting while you drive. 
Of course, there's the same easy lifting tailgate and the transition from full five seater to practical load carrier is just as simple. With front wheel drive and the transverse engine, there's the maximum amount of space inside the car for passengers and luggage, while the overall length of the car is kept to a minimum. Even with all the space inside, the SL Estate is just 32 foot 2 inches long. And it's just as happy weaving in and out of traffic as it is negotiating country lanes. With all that luxury and stylish metallic finish, the SL Estate is just right for town and country. So let's look at some of those nice bits, extra little bits of finishings on this top model. So to start off, much nicer seats, aren't they? They look really comfortable and you get those safety headrests in there, which obviously is a big improvement and you know, much nicer in interior. We've got a two-tone, um, two-colour door card, which is looks quite nice as well. The outside of this car is, I don't know if you can just make it out here, it's metallic green and these almost like orange coloured seats really stand out I do like the look of this particular model a little bit of a look at some of the instrumentation and this unusual little image showing that heated rear window but like I say unusually no wiper on it now the interior of the SL notes now a gold Peugeot emblem how fancy Still no rev counter though. We've still got a clock, although it looks like they've reversed the gauges. Now the clock's on the left of the gauges. That's a little bit unusual. Same sort of idea of folding the seats down to make that bed type arrangement. And then if we just zoom in on this last image, here we can see that nice sort of like bed area, this mahogany finish looks very fancy, doesn't it? Send this on a couple of French cars actually. A nice treatment for the top of the range model. And then we get to the last pages. Nice little image of the dimensions and then the specifications. Now I don't usually really take a look at the dimensions because they don't really work very well for camera but I thought I'd throw these in just because they're such nicely drawn images on this little yellow example. And it also gives you an idea where it keeps the spur tire on that um, right hand picture to you know create a flatter load area and then we get these nice little images you know showing you know space in the back there where you can put your suitcases and of course the practicality of being able to fold that rear seat down to increase your load area and at the end of the, I thought this was quite an interesting little uh, bit of a paragraph and Know, column it says all Peugeot cars are result of careful attention to detail in design one illustration of this is that the three or four estates have the spur wheel mounted underneath the boot floor this means there is more room for luggage and no need to unload the boot in an event of a puncture the spare is always readily accessible built-in strength and safety is another feature that Peugeot demand of all their cars each year many cars are destroyed in simulated accidents as part of a continuum research program to improve safety improvements suggested by the research are then incorporated into Peugeot's production cars a rigorous quality control system has built an impressive reputation for Peugeot's strength and reliability. And of course, all new Peugeots are covered by a straightforward 12-month unlimited mileage guarantee. And then the specification starting off with the mechanical. So the gearbox is a synchromesh gearbox with four forward speeds and reverse diaphragm type clutch with ball bearing thrust operation suspension all round independent suspension with coil springs and Peugeot's double acting telescopic hydraulic shock absorbers anti-roll bars front and rear brakes disc brakes at front drums at rear uh, master vac power assisted braking dual braking circuits with uh, compensator 
and electrical system 12 volt with an alternator as you would really expect and tires steering is rack and pinion so it tells us the engine's a four cylinder engine mounted transversely front wheel drive aluminium alloy cylinder block and head removable wet cylinder liners and a overhead camshaft five bearing crankshaft electromagnetic cooling fan Fuel supplies a single choke carburetor, uh, capacity is 1290cc. And it gives you an idea of the maximum power there, 65 bhp, maximum speed 94 miles per hour. So equipment levels, cloth seats on the SL, I think that was worth it enough to get to the SL. Um, GL got leverette upholstery and then the SL got metallic paint finishes, head restraints, glove box, front carpet, padded steering wheel and a two-speed windscreen wiper. And then the rest of the features they all have, so electric windscreen washers, rear fog light, reversing lights, hazard warning lights, heated rear window, fully reclining front seats, inertia reel front seat belts, door armrests front and rear, variable speed heater and demister, illuminated heater, demister controls, quartz clock, trip mileage recorder, day night rear view mirror a child proof locks on rear doors padded sun visor with vanity mirror on passenger side cigarette lighter water temperature gauge chalk warning light brake warning light handbrake on low brake fluid and a diagnostic test socket and then right at the end here you can just about make out the fuel consumption same for the gl or as or the sl same engine of course so uh, constant 56 to getting 42.8 miles per gallon so there we go the little Peugeot 304 a little bit out of date by this time I'm kind of like was thinking if you really wanted a French car yeah fabulous get one of these I do like them and they are a bit different but what else could you get at the time that might have been equivalent well I do have this Renault all range brush of a 1978 so let's just have a quick flick through that so yeah i'm not going to spend too much time on this right now but i mean there was nice one there 78 nice full range brushes renault gave out at this time um i'm still trying to think what what else we could get in the late 70s maybe a renault 6 that's kind of like a similar sort of idea similar sort of style if you wanted a bigger estate, I guess you could move up to a uh, a Renault 12. You know, that came as an estate. Still pretty old-fashioned cars, though, aren't they? So I kind of like thinking, what does Citroen has to offer? Citroen, of course, always look far more advanced, I think. This is 79 when the GSA just came out. As you can see, the new GSA. But you could have that as an estate. So it looks a lot more advanced, a lot more futuristic than the uh, 304 and what Renault had to offer at that time as well. Possibly a little bit of a bigger car, but if I had to choose, I think I'd go for that. And of course, a lot of people did. But anyway, kind of like a by the by. That was the Peugeot 304 that we looked at today. There she is. What an interesting car. And like I say, by 1980, looking very old fashioned, and I'm sure they didn't sell many, but I wouldn't mind only one of them today, I must admit. So there you go, the Peugeot 304. Yeah, a bit out of date by this time, but nevertheless, a great car. And how many of these are left today? I don't know. They were pretty well made, actually, but I think Rust was, as always, what got them in the end. Thank you for watching. Please do comment if you do remember these. I do always read every comment and really enjoy reading those. And of course, if you're not done already, please do subscribe. That really helps the channel. But for now, we'll say take care, all the best, and goodbye.